Hi students, welcome to chapter 8 of your physics lecture series. In this topic, we'll be doing gravitation. It's one of the most interesting and exciting physics topics that you can learn about because there are many applications to the real life and there are many astronomy examples uh, that usually people get very excited to learn about. So before we begin, begin this lecture proper, I have a quick quiz for you that's not related to this topic but is related to our opening slide. Now, uh, on this opening slide, we have a picture of the moon. Right? And we all know that the moon is far away from the Earth. And, but it is possible for us to shine a laser pointer at the surface of the moon. In fact, there have been experiments using laser pointers to reflect off a reflective object placed on the surface of the moon to measure the moon's distance from the Earth. Now, this object was placed during one of the Apollo missions. And uh, you can conduct these experiments or you can watch an episode of Big Bang Theory. It has Howard Wallowitz doing that. Now, anyway, uh, to this quiz is about laser pointers, right? And we know that there's a universal speed limit on how fast objects can move in the universe. And the speed of light is C. And that's a really, really fast speed. Uh, is it possible to violate this speed? I'm going to give you a thought experiment. So let's say I shine the laser pointer on the surface of the moon. Now, if I moved my hand such that the laser pointer's point swung across the entire surface of the moon, it is possible for the laser dot to move faster than the speed of light, right? Or is it impossible? It depends on how fast I swing my hand, but because the moon is actually a very small object in our sky, I can do this pretty quickly. Have I violated the speed of light? If I have, how is it possible? If I have not, why have I not violated the speed of light? If you have an answer, you can key it into the quiz that I'm going to give you all at the a feedback form, sorry, in a QR code, and you can key the answer to the quiz in if you want. I'll review the answer to the quiz in the next lecture. Alright, so let's begin this lecture proper. In this topic, we'll be doing with Newton's law of gravitation, which explains to us the force between objects with mass. Right? And from there, we'll explore related concepts, gravitational field strength, which tells us about how the objects with mass affect the empty space around it, gravitational potential energy, the capacity to do work in lieu of the fact that there are gravitational forces. And lastly, gravitational potential, which is a very abstract concept. We'll also deal with how these four quantities are related to one another and apply them to useful and novel situations such as the orbits of planets, orbits of stars, and how satellites move around the Earth and in other applications as well. So a very exciting topic. Now, humankind has always been excited about the cosmos. In fact, uh, there's been a space race to reach the moon, even during the middle of a Cold War, right? Where US and uh, the Soviet Union at that time were rushing to reach the moon. Of course, the US won by putting a man on the moon first, but it was actually the Russians that put a man into space before the US. Now, since then, there have been so many uh, space exploration missions. But in order to do something as simple as send a man to a moon, nothing simple about that, right? We actually only required uh, cal calculations within gravitation. So we had to understand how we had to escape the Earth's atmosphere and of course land safely on the moon, take samples and return that person back. right? So whether it is uh, planets, moons, satellites, the Apollo mission or even entire galaxies or the universe as a whole, the motion of astronomical objects are governed by the forces of gravity. And in fact, on right on Earth, the reason why we fall is also due to gravity, right? Because gravity gives us weight. Now, the concept of gravity can be applied to so many situations and they can be gorgeous and beautiful. Within this few slides, I've included some QR codes. They're only for enrichment purposes. So if you're interested to learn more about certain things like star formation or meteors, please feel free to scan this QR code and pause the video and go and watch a short uh, video on this topic or uh, it's a website that you can learn more, right? But no obligations, those are not A-level content. Uh, A-level content will be covered within the lecture itself. So on this first picture here, we see M51, which is actually a colliding galaxy. Uh, right, you can see uh, this big spiral galaxy on the right is colliding with a more small irregular shaped galaxy. So it is a gravitational force that's attracting these two galaxies together. And actually, our own Milky Way galaxy is going to collide with the Andromeda galaxy in several billion years. So you can go and uh, read up about that in the QR code. So galaxy can be, uh, gra gravity can produce some beautiful pictures, right? Um, 
When comets move around the sun, they leave behind an ice and dust trail. So when the Earth moves past this trail of ice and dust, sometimes the particles enter our atmosphere and burn up. And that produces meteors, which are beautiful, right? So if you have watched Kimi no Nama Ewa, I think you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and this last picture here is the very famous Orion Nebula. You can see it during the winter time in the constellation Orion. So ask any Astronomy Club member, he should be able to point it out to you uh, in January, right? Uh, in the Orion Nebula, it's basically nothing but gas clouds in space. But because there's gravitational forces between the gas particles, some of them collapse and coalesce into young new stars. So that's why certain parts of it are so bright. If you want to find out more about star formation, you can read this QR code. Right, gravity can also be very, very useful. Now, if you've ever watched an astronaut do a spacewalk outside a spa the space shuttle or the International Space Station, you realize how super troublesome it is to be able to try to move around without gravity or with low levels of gravity. Furthermore, human beings, our bodies are accustomed to living within the gravitational field of the Earth and our bones will actually become more and more and more brittle under the influence of weightlessness. Right? Now, Gravity is also responsible for high and low tides. That's the gravitational force of attraction between the moon and the water bodies on Earth. And this can be actually applied to produce tidal energy, right? And of course, what can be more useful to us than the origin of life itself? So just like in the Orion Nebula where there are young stars forming, our solar system must have formed from some similar solar nebula where dust and gas accumulated into the sun and the nine or eight planets of our solar system. Sorry, Pluto's not counted anymore. So the eight planets of our solar system. So yes, gravity is responsible for assembling the solar system and of course, Earth. Now, gravity can also produce very scary effects. So when a star is unable to support its mass, it collapses in on itself because of gravitational attraction. So if you look here in the middle, some stars, if they're massive enough, will explode in a fiery explosion called a supernova. So this is M1, Crab Nebula, which is a leftover gas cloud from the explosion of a star. Right, gravity can also be very irritating. For example, the biggest impediment to space travel is that it takes a lot of energy to escape from the Earth's gravity. So you have to accelerate your spacecraft to a certain speed, which we will learn how to calculate in the next few lectures, right? But that requires a lot of energy. So it is very difficult to get to space from Earth because of the amount of GPE that we'll need to overcome, right? And threats from space still do exist. Um, m many million years ago, 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs walked the Earth. Now they do not. And we do think that it is because of a large asteroid that produced something called the Chicxulub Crater that caused the mass extinction of dinosaurs. And looking back in Earth's history, there have been many, many periods of mass extinctions. So let's hope one is not headed our way. But all this is because gravity governs the motion of asteroids in the solar system. And when the asteroids collide with the Earth, yep, their GPE gets converted into lots and lots of KE. Right? So gravity can be scary as well. Now, many students, before they start the concept of gravity, they would have uh, read about you know, space-time and relativity. So what exactly is gravity that we're teaching you at A-level? Now, we're teaching you gravity as a force, similar to a, a, a push and a pull that you would get when you push a box on the floor. So we're thinking of gravity in terms of a force. Now, this is a fundamental understanding of gravity. It is not wrong, but it has been shown to be uh, generalized into a more difficult and complicated concept by Einstein. Uh, and that theory is known as the general theory of relativity. Under that theory, gravity is no longer a force, but objects simply move because objects with mass curve the space-time around it. So that's not A-level, but it's very interesting if you want further knowledge, and you definitely need to understand this topic if you want to go on and study further physics. right? So we'll only be covering gravity as a force in A-level, all right? Uh, we're going to refer to this flow chart or this mind map very often during the lecture. So at the start and the end of the lecture, I will check back with you guys uh, to recap what we have learned. So in this first topic, we're just going to be, uh, in this first lecture, I beg your pardon, we'll just be doing the force of gravitation. All right. And the force of gravitation 
Okay. Or another way of saying it, it is Newton's law of universal gravitation was formulated by Sir Isaac Newton, who is also very famous for inventing calculus and the three laws of motion that you have spent a lot of tutorials doing. So the Newton's law of gravitation states that every particle of matter in the universe attracts every other particle with a force which is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance apart. So this law is about force, right? And uh, of course, the story was very famous on how he saw an apple fall from a tree. I don't think the apple actually hit his head in the real story. And because of that, he started to think about forces beyond just objects needing to touch one another and push one another, but something that is more invisible that can act from a distance. And that idea is very central to our understanding of gravity. So I repeat again, the law of universal gravitation or Newton's law of gravitation basically gives us the gravitational force. And the gravitational force is proportional to the square of the mass, the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance apart. Now, what is it proportional to? It is proportional to capital G, which is called the gravitational constant. And the value of the gravitational constant is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meter square per kg square. So this constant, capital G, actually scales the gravitational force. Within our universe, this is the value of G. You can, of course, consider alternate universes with different values of G. Then gravity will be proportionally weaker or stronger in those universes. Now, force is a vector. So sometimes we include a negative sign in the mathematical expression for the law of gravitation. Uh, this is to indicate that the direction of this force is opposed to the direction of sign convention. So typically we'll start, we have an origin and there'll be a radius vector. So the negative sign indicates that the force acts in the opposite direction of the radius vector. So it points backwards. So actually this indicates that the force is attractive in nature. Whereas if there's no minus sign and all the values here are positive, then this will be a positive force which points away from an object. So we just must be very careful as well in this equation because in this equation, when we're talking about r square, the distance apart, actually we're talking about point masses. So the distance between point masses, right? If it's the distance between point masses, uh, then if the object is not a point mass, we technically cannot use this equation because r is the distance between the objects. Now, please be careful if you look at the universal law of gravitation, it is a force and force is a vector. So if you have a multiple masses in a system, they each produce gravitational forces on one another. So any one object in a system can have more than one gravitational force acting on it if there is two, if there's more than two objects, right? Uh, if you want to find the net force acting on the object, you must vectorially add up the forces together, not linearly. That's because force is a vector, right? Hmm. The Earth is not a point mass and neither is the Moon, but we can still apply Newton's law of gravity to them, right? So what gives? Well, if an object is a uniform sphere, we can assume that all the mass lies in the middle of the uniform sphere. So R can then be the distance measured between the geometric center of uniform spheres. So if it's a uniform sphere, uh, we can treat it the same as if it was all a point mass that lies in its center. So R will just be the distance between the center of spheres. However, this is only true for uniform spheres. There are many shapes in the universe uh, for objects in the universe that are not uniform spheres, right? But there's still gravitational force acting on them. For example, the International Space Station is not a uniform sphere, but we can calculate the gravitational force. And strictly speaking, neither is the Earth. The Earth is actually a bit uh, bulging in its middle. So how then do we treat it? Well, if it's not a uniform sphere, then for any other object, we'll just look for its center of mass. The center of mass is where we'll measure R from. So we got three situations. If it's a point mass, it's easy. We just take the distance between the masses. If it's a uniform sphere, we'll use the geometric center. If it's not uniform, then if it's any other shape, we'll just measure from the center of mass. Or another reason why it's called that is the center of gravity. So R we measured from there. Now, uh, Newton's law will show you that the force is proportional to 1 over R square, 
which means if I have two objects, the nearer they are to one another, the larger the force they produce on one another. And the further away they are from one another, this force falls with an inverse R square relationship. We call such few, uh, such relationships an inverse square law. So this is one of the first few times you see in A level, but we'll see it again and again uh, in future chapters. So this is basically how the force diminishes over longer and longer distance or larger and larger distances. So the further objects are, the weaker the force. How much weaker? It is proportional to 1 over R square. Now, the force of gravity, gravity is not the only fundamental force of nature. So every other force that you have learned so far actually can be subsumed into one of the four fundamental forces. The four fundamental forces are gravity, electromagnetism, which includes uh, charged particles, attraction, and magnets, strong and weak nuclear forces, which are forces that only exist significantly in subatomic levels. So if I had to ask the question, how does gravity compare to the other forces of nature? Is gravity a strong force or not very strong force? We can actually look at the example of their equations. So in gravity, F, the gravitational force, is scaled by capital G, the gravitational constant, which is to the power of minus 11. So it's actually pretty weak when you compare that to the, gra the electric force. And the electric force is proportional to 1 over epsilon naught. So 1 over epsilon naught is the constant that scales the electric force for charged particles. This you will learn in a later chapter in JC2. So it turns out that electrical forces are stronger than gravitational forces. But because on average, um, electrical forces will balance each other out, the total number of charges leaves objects mostly neutral on a whole, gravity will dominate. But gravity will dominate when the masses are very large. So it is important to consider the force of gravity for astronomical and large objects, and it is usually unimportant for subatomic objects where their masses are very, very, very small and their charges are large by comparison. Now, can we, if I say that uh, gravity is only important for large scale objects, can we verify this on Earth? Oh, and the answer is, of course we can. This is a very famous experiment called the Cavendish experiment, and in this experiment, like all other uh, physics experiments, we want to be as precise as possible, which means our answers want to have more and more and more decimal places so that we can get better results, right? Uh, we, or we want to learn the true value of, say, a uh, constant g. So in this case, right, we have a very, very carefully set up experiment where there are two tiny masses on opposite ends of a rod. And this rod is suspended by a quartz fiber. So of course, everything in this uh, apparatus must be separated. You must be in a vacuum chamber. Uh, there can be no other influence acting on them other than their masses. Now, because they're opposite ends of one another, these two small masses will of course attract one another, but they don't, they don't produce any motion. However, we're going to introduce two large masses that are going to be placed on opposite sides of the small masses. And this will this very small gravitational force, because these are everyday objects at this, at, at, and on Earth, uh, the gravitational force is very small. However, it will produce a large enough moment that this quartz fiber will start to twist. And the amount of twisting it does will depend on how resistant the quartz fiber is to twisting. So of course, when there is an equ depending on the mass that we put here, there will be an equilibrium position in which the quartz fiber stretches as it twists producing a tensional force that resists the attractive force of gravitation. And using a very carefully calibrated mirror and scale and laser beam, we can check how much twisting occurred. And if we know the tensile strength of the quartz fiber, we will be able to calculate a value for the gravitational force, which then will give us a value for G. So this is one of the real life experiments, and you can watch this experiment on the QR code uh, video link right here. So go ahead and pause it if you want to go and watch. Right, but the, the fact is we can conduct carefully calibrated experiments to determine capital G. Right, let's come to the first worked example. In the first worked example, we have three objects, M1, M2, and M3. So M1 and M2 and M3 are stationary. We put M3 in between M1 and M2 such that M3 uh, is at equilibrium, right? 
Uh, of course, because M3 is attracted to M1, M3 will experience a gravitational force F13 due to M1. So this is Newton's law of gravitation. And M2 also has mass, so M2 will attract M3 with a force in the opposite direction, F23. So if M3 is in equilibrium, can I find an expression for X that is in terms of M1, M2, M3, and D? So pretty uh, simple case. Since the object M3 is in equilibrium, we can write down an equation to say that F1 is equal to F2. The two forces are equal and opposite, so they must balance one another so that the M3 is at equilibrium. So of course here I'm using magnitude, right? magnitude of F1 is the magnitude of F2. So we can substitute F1 with GMM over R square, Newton's law of gravitation, for object 1, 3, the pair object 1, 3. So M1 is one of the masses and M3 is the other mass. And the distance between 1 and 3 is given by X, so it's X square. Now on the right hand side, we have F2, so it will be M2 and M3 that will be substituted but the distance between 2, 3 is d minus x. Because this big distance between 1 and 2 is small d, and the distance between 1 and 3 is x, so the distance between 3 and 2 is d minus x. So don't forget the square. Now we can make x the subject of the equation, and we arrive with the final expression that we need. So this one has been done for you. All you need to do is just work it out yourself as well to make sure you know how to do the algebra for this. And one common mistake that is made is uh, people forgetting to expand the square here. So after they have written down the square, they do d square minus x square, which is incorrect, right? Because the square is outside of the bracket. Okay, so that's example one. So this concludes the discussion on gravitational force. Now, in this lecture, we'll just discuss the next concept which is gravitational field and in gravitational fields uh, it's pretty abstract so please do rewatch if you're not very sure what it means <clears throat> and there's a relationship between the gravitational force and the gravitational field and we'll, we'll discuss it later okay so a gravitational field straight away by definition is a region of space and this region of space surrounds an object that has a mass such that any other object that ma with mass that is placed in that region will experience an attractive gravitational force. So we'll actually learn about other types of fields later on, electric fields and magnetic fields, but the definition will be similar. So you always have a certain type of field, it's a region of space such that a certain type of object will experience a certain type of force. So gravitational fields applies to a type of to, to a region of space, right? It doesn't apply to objects. It's talking about regions of space. So it's possible for us to draw out the field within the region of space and represent it with a diagram. And we call them gravitational field lines. So in this diagram here on the right, the Earth has mass, so the Earth has its gravitational field. The Moon also has mass, so the Moon also has a gravitational field. And because of that, the whole space that surrounds them will have the property of an object with mass placed there will experience some gravitational force. So of course when two objects have mass, they produce their own fields, the fields will have to add up somehow. So you have to learn how to add up fields in this topic. Now just a quick side discussion. In pop culture, right, there's always this uh, term used called force field. And uh, it's always used to protect objects. So this picture here is from Star Wars Episode 1 at uh, Phantom Menace, where the Gungans were, were deploying this huge shield that protected their army from the Separatist forces. And you can see that there are explosions on the surface of this force field. Now in pop culture, right, force fields are finite in size. They always extend to a certain size. Not sure why, perhaps it depends on how powerful the shield is. Uh, force fields can also block projectiles, like when a projectile hits the surface of the shield, they'll be blocked. And depending on how many projectiles hit it, the shield can be diminished. So it requires energy to sustain. So these are force fields in pop culture. However, when we're studying physics, right, the concept of fields is completely different. In this case, in physics, a field will always be present and it will always extend to infinity provided you have 
at least one object with mass. So for example, if the Earth was all alone in space, the entire space surrounding Earth all the way to infinity will have a gravitational force field. But this field will actually decrease the further away you get from the Earth. right? And in addition, any object that you place in this field will experience a force. So it can't block projectiles. In fact, for the Earth, when you place an object in its field, it will be attracted to the Earth. So it attracts projectiles in a way. right? And lastly, uh, it doesn't require energy to turn on. It is always on. That means as long as the Earth exists and it has mass, there will always be a gravitational field in space to infinity because of its mass. So it doesn't require energy to turn on. It's always on in a sense. But gravitational fields can produce forces on gravitational uh, on masses if you place a second mass in the gravitational field and that force itself can do work so a gravitational field can produce energy changes or can do work so it's quite different from the pop culture term force field so please be careful we're actually using this kind of force field in physics so a diagram to show you a force field would look something like this with the earth at the center the mass that's producing the field, then the orange color lines are what we call gravitational field lines. So in the gravitational field line, there are certain, uh, there are certain aspects to the gravitational field lines that we need to take note when drawing. Now, gravitational field lines, right, the density of the field lines will tell you how strong the field is. So if you look at two possible positions, position A and position B, position A is nearer the Earth, and you can tell that the field lines are more dense nearer the Earth, so we'll indicate that this gravitational field is stronger when the field line is denser than at position B, where the density of field lines is fewer, right? So that's a weaker field. Okay. Uh, in addition, we must note that field lines cannot cross one another. This is because the field lines represent the value of the field at that point in space. So if the field lines cross one another, you have two possible fields at that one position in space. It doesn't make sense. So what you will need to do is you need to resolve the two and add them up together vectorially to get the resultant field. And that's why the Earth-Moon field looks like this. This is the effective field produced by the Earth and the Moon. Next, the field lines point in a direction that a force acts. So from our definition of gravitational field, it a gravitational field is a region of space where if I put a mass there, it will experience a gravitational force. So if I put a mass here in this diagram, the field line will tell me what the direction of the force is. And in this case, it would be downwards. So, of course, earlier on we drew a diagram here to show the Earth. And it seems like the field lines don't point parallel to one another, right? In fact, they point towards the center of the Earth. So, how come we say that the gravitational field on Earth is uniform? Well, that's actually only approximately true. So for small distances, we can approximate that the field lines are parallel. So near the surface of the Earth, we say the, the gravitational field lines are parallel and they're equally spaced out, so we have a uniform field. So this is only approximately true. Of course, in reality, the field lines are not parallel to one another. They converge at the Earth's center of mass, right? But it's just that for the surface of the Earth, the distances are so small that we don't really feel the change in the gravitational field strength as you move small distances up and down above the ground. So that's why we consider them a uh, uniform field only near the surface of the Earth. Okay, that's a concept of field and field lines. How do we do calculation? That will come next. Okay, so uh, there's this concept in general relativity, so this is also enrichment. We can actually imagine space as some kind of fabric and that fabric, we can call it space-time, okay? It's just a fancy term for some very complex geometry. Um, objects can simulate their motion as if they're undergoing a gravitational force by the fact that this space-time gets bent by masses. So a more massive object like the one in this picture in green will bend the space-time around it more. So if you have a small mass that passes through it, this region of space, it will have to follow the curve. So it's as if it was experiencing a gravitational force. Now this is a bit complicated, but uh, we can visualize it by stretching a piece of rubber and putting objects in it. So if you want to, you can watch this QR code, which has a link to a YouTube video that simulates this uh, bending of space-time. So if you think that gravitational fields are abstract, you can, you can think of gravitational fields as this fabric 
that exists and this fabric is normally flat however because um, an object has mass it changes the shape of the fabric so this is another way of visualizing gravitational fields but it's actually more complicated so if you're not very sure don't worry about it now gravitational fields are regions of space right at each point in the gravitational field we can describe what is called the gravitational field strength small g now the gravitational field strength right is defined as the force per unit mass acting on any mass placed at that point so every object with mass produces a gravitational field if you were to put a second mass at that point depending on the second masses mass it would experience a gravitational force the field strength is simply that force divided by the mass placed there so it's force per unit mass can I repeat again gravitational field strength is force per unit mass so gravitational field strength small g is also a vector because capital F the gravitational force is a vector now we can substitute the gravitational force with Newton's law of gravitation so we'll neglect the negative sign in this case we're just talking about the magnitude the gravitational field strength at any point in space surrounding a mass of mass m is given by gm over r square so this small g we call it gravitational field strength okay So you'll notice that this equation g equals to gm over r square if we consider its direction it will also point back towards the origin so therefore is we include a negative sign to show that its direction is opposite that of the radius vector so it's the same direction as gravitational force and the second thing you notice about gravitational field strength right is in the formula there's actually only one mass this mass capital m is mass that's producing the field around it so the second mass disappears because it is force per unit mass so if you want to calculate the force you will need to know what is the mass of the second object you put there right so we'll do an example to demonstrate that uh, so considering two masses m1 m2 m1 is 800 kg and m2 is 600 kg m1 and m2 are separated by 0 0.25 meters so a let's calculate the gravitational field strength placed at this point x so there are two gravitational fields being produced right m2 has mass so it produces a gravitational field or the whole space surrounding it m1 also has a mass so m1 produces its own gravitational field in the entire space surrounding it so at point x there will be two field strengths g1 and g2 g1 comes from m1 and g2 comes from m2 produced at point x so point x is at this distance 0 0.15 meters from m2 and 0 0.2 meters from m1 so at point x there are two field strengths now what we are supposed to find is the gravitational field strength at x so what we are looking for is the combined gravitational field strength or the net gravitational field strength acting at this point x so do i need an object at x at the moment i don't need because field strength doesn't require an object to be placed there it is just a property of that particular point in space the property of if I place an object there with a certain mass it will experience a certain force so let's calculate the field strength so G1 is the gravitational field strength due to mass 1 we can calculate it using the formula GM over R square so we'll substitute it and get this value we can also find g2 which is the gravitational field strength at point x due to mass 2 so we'll substitute in g m2 and r square to get this other field strength right now, of course the r's are different because the, uh, the distance to object 1 and the distance to object 2 from x is different now now that we've gotten these two field strength we must recall that field strength is vectors so if I want to find the resultant field at x, I need to vectorially add up g1 and g2. So for this question, it's a bit simplified. Uh, the angle between g1 and g2 is a right angle. So it makes it easier for us to find the resultant. We only need to apply Pythagoras theorem in this case. Otherwise, you have to apply sine or cosine rule to, uh, to get the, the value of g, right? If you want to add two vectors together. So in this case, the resultant gravitational field strength is 2.22 times 10 to the minus 6 
and the units for gravitational field strength is newtons per kg because it is force per unit mass. So newtons per kg. However, to finish, ex to finish answering the question, not only do we have to give the resultant uh, magnitude of G, we still need to give an angle because G, gravitational field strength at X, is a vector. So in the case of any vector, we not only need to give its magnitude for the answer, we need to give the direction. So we'll take direction of angle theta, which is uh, clockwise from G2. So we can calculate th theta by using tangent. Tangent theta equals G1 over G2. We can solve to find theta equals 37 degrees. So we can say G resultant is 2.22 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons per kg at an angle 37 degrees to G2, or 37 degrees clockwise from G2. So that gives you a complete answer for A, which is the gravitational field strength at point X due to, its, due to M1 and M2. Let's take a look at example 2b. So now, in this question, I place a mass of 300 kg at point x. What's the force that this mass of 300 kg will experience? We'll simply use the equation force equals to mg. This actually comes from the relationship gravitational field strength is force per unit mass, right? So if I wanted to find the force acting on the particular mass of mass m, I can use F equals to mg, which looks very familiar, right? Because this literally is the weight of an object on Earth. It's just that g, in this case, can be a different value in space, or depending on the situation. So on Earth, small g is 9.81 meters per second square, or newtons per kg. It's the same units, actually, if you work it out. So small g has units of acceleration. So we can now calculate the force that this 300 kg object will experience. This 300 kg object will experience 6.7 times 10 to the minus 4 newtons, right? Because it's a force, and the force is in the direction of the field strength. So earlier on, we calculated that the field strength was 37 degrees from G2. So the force will also be in the same direction. So the force will act at an uh, object placed at point X in this direction of the vector given by G, the direction of the vector given by small g. But the force depends on the mass I place there. So field strength is constant for a position in space, but the force will depend on the mass of the object at place at that point. Okay, let's apply gravitational field strength to the Earth. So in example 3, we are asked to find the mass of the Earth by considering the Earth's gravitational field near its surface. So. The Earth's gravitational field near its surface, small g, is actually a gravitational acceleration due to gravity, and it's nine. Excuse me, it's nine point eight one meters per second square, given in your data booklet. So in this example, we'll just use g equals to nine point eight. So the units is newtons per kg is equivalent to meters per second square. You can go and try to derive this if you want to. Uh, we are given that the radius of the Earth, capital R, is six point four times ten to the six meters. So starting with our formula from gravitational field strength, g equals to gm over r squared, where m is the mass of the Earth, and r is the distance from the center of the Earth. So we can then make m the subject, and say m equals to g r squared over g. Here we are going to substitute small r as capital R, where r is the radius of the Earth. So technically I could have put small r at any distance that I want, and obtain a field strength depending on that distance, right? So I want to find what it is at the surface of the Earth because I'm already given that the surface of the Earth, the value of small g is 9.8. So sometimes uh, we try to use this convention where small r is a variable, then you can substitute any distance inside that you want. So if you are further away from, you want to find the field strength further away from Earth, you substitute a bigger value in. If you want to find the field strength at the surface of the Earth, you have to substitute the radius of the Earth, capital R, or R subscript E, to indicate that fixed value that you want to substitute in. Okay, so here we're substituting the radius of the Earth. So we can do the calculations and get the mass of the Earth to be about 6 times 10 to the 24 kg. So it's impossible to weigh the Earth with a weighing scale, right? Because the reason why weighing scales work is because there is 
gravity from the Earth in the first place. So this is another way we actually measure the mass of the Earth by finding small g. So in all your physics experiments um, that you'll be doing in J1, many of them ask you to find the value of small g, the acceleration due to gravity. Now if you didn't think about it before, think about it again. If you know how to do that, and you know how to find the radius of the Earth through some geometry, you can go and Google that, how to find the radius of the Earth. Ancient people have done it in the past. You can then weigh the Earth without having a weighing scale big enough for the Earth. That's amazing, right? Okay, let's do one more experiment. Uh, sorry, example. Experiments are for real life. Okay, let's do one more example. So, assuming that the Earth is spherical, show that the density of the Earth is given by rho equals to 3g over 4 pi capital G R. So obviously we know the Earth is not a fixed density, la, but we can calculate the average density. So the density of any object is given by its mass divided by its volume. However, we know the mass of the Earth is G R square over G from example 3, right? And we know that the volume of the Earth is the volume of a sphere of radius r. So we substitute v as 4 pi r cubed. 4 third pi r cubed, sorry. And we can simplify this equation to get 3g over 4 pi g r. So the density of the Earth can also be estimated using our mass of the Earth that we calculated earlier on. Oh. Now, uh, Talking about practical, we can determine G using many experiments. So sometimes we have pendulum experiments that determine G. This is one simple way of determining G directly. Because small g is the gravitational field strength, but it is also the gravitational acceleration felt by objects in a gravitational field. So small g is force per unit mass. But because force per unit mass is actually Newton's second law, then G is actually acceleration. So we can apply kinematics to a simple problem like this where we have an electromagnet that is connected to a photogate and a timer. So when this magnet is releases the ball bearing, it will fall and the time t taken to fall to photogate A can be recorded and the time t B taken to fall to photogate B can also be recorded. So from drop point to photogate A, you can get an equation using ut equals to s equals to ut plus half at squared. So the initial velocity is zero, the final velocity is half gt squared. And to fall to photogate b, you need to fall through a distance y and h. So the final speed at b is half gtb squared. So you can put these two together to eliminate them and get g, the gravitational field strength or the gravitational acceleration due to gravity as 2h over t square b minus t square a. All right, so we can actually do simple experiments to find the value of g. Now in this next part, we'll try to think about field strength within the earth. So we do know that outside of the earth, we can use the equation g equals to gm over r square to find the field strength outside of the earth. And all the way up to the surface of the Earth, right, this is true. Because at the surface of the Earth, we can just assume the rest of the Earth is a uniform sphere. So all its mass actually lies in its center. So our assumption for Newton's law of gravitation is correct. Which means that if I wanted to find the field strength at the surface of the Earth, I still can. But the moment I get past the surface of the Earth, right, mm, it is not true anymore, right? Because not all its mass lies in its center. Some of its mass is outside of that distance. So how do we do that? Well, we'll take a look. So for distances greater than the Earth's surface, we know we follow an inverse square law because gravitational field strength is gm over r square. So, so far, so good. We know that outside of capital R, the, the radius of the Earth, uh, the field strength falls proportionally to 1 over r square. Okay, it's our inverse square law. So it's proportional to 1 over r squared. Now, below the surface of the Earth, right, we have two portions of the Earth. One portion that is within the distance r. So let's say we're at a distance r. There's an inner sphere that is below our feet. But above us, right, there is an outer shell with mass as well. So it turns out 
there's this theorem called shell theorem that requires some advanced calculus to derive, but actually it's not undoable. If you're curious, go Google a derivation of shell theorem. But shell theorem basically says, right, that if I'm if I put a mass at this point inside the inside a sphere of uniform density, the mass the mass that's within the distance r or the radius r, you can think of all that mass as at the center of gra at the center of the of, of the sphere. So if you wanted to find the force acting on an object there due to the yellow portion, it would just be due to the mass that exists in the center as if it's in the center. So we can use GMM over R square for that. However, for the mass that lies on the outside, it turns out because it doesn't matter where you are, as long as you are around this dotted line, the cumulative effect of the rest of the mass will cancel itself out. So that's called shell theorem. Basically, when you're within a shell with mass, the external shell doesn't have any gravitational force on any object within the shell. So if you somehow manage to hollow the earth out by digging out all this yellow stuff and throwing it away, and the earth is now a shell of this thickness, this white thickness, anytime you're inside, you have no gravitational force, zero gravitational force. Okay, that's pretty interesting, right? So that's called shell theorem. Now, of course, we're not digging out the yellow portion. The yellow portion still exists. So it produces a gravitational force on any object placed there, which also means that there is a gravitational field there. So we can say that the gravitational field, any distance within the Earth's radius, is given by gm over small r square, where small r is the radius to the point that I'm at. And m1 will be the mass of the remaining mass within the shell. So it doesn't include the white volume, only the yellow volume. So this mass, right, I can find in terms of density, because I know the volume of this yellow portion it's just 4 third pi r cubed. Uh, sorry, 4 third pi... Yeah, 4 third pi r cubed. That's the volume, right? And then, if I want to get the mass m1, I only need to multiply it by the density of the Earth. So we're assuming that the Earth is uniform in density. So we can replace this yellow mass m1 with 4 third pi r cubed rho. So we can simplify this further. And you'll realize that the r square, the denominator, cancels out the r cubed at the numerator, leaving just r. So within the Earth, the gravitational field suddenly becomes proportional to r. Right? 4 third g and pi and rho are all constants. So it's proportional to r, a straight line graph instead. So if you put this together, you'll find that the gravitational field outside of the Earth's radius falls with inverse square law. And it reaches a value g0, which is 9.8 at the surface of the Earth. And within the Earth, if you were manage to drill some kind of hole in, because of shell theorem, g now that suddenly becomes proportional to r. And of course, when you're at the center, there's nothing left within your radius r. Obviously, so the gravitational field must go to zero. So this is the gravitational field for an object with uniform mass inside and outside of its radius. So this, of course, assumes that the Earth is constant in density, which it is not. So it turns out if we do consider the Earth being made up of a solid inner core, which is high density, a slightly lower density outer core, a solid mantle, which is lower in density, and of course a low density crust until we get to the surface of the Earth, we can modify the equation, obviously it's difficult, but we can, to show that it should be something like this, the gravitational field strength, right? It should follow something other than the green line. The green line assumes that the Earth is uniform in density. So it will actually look different from the graph that we derived because the Earth is not uniform in density. The, there's more mass towards the center than towards the outer portions. Okay, so that's just some extra knowledge. So the only thing that we didn't prove is shell theorem. So you have to take my word for it or go and read some def derivation for it to say that when you're inside a mass shell, the external shell doesn't have effect on gravitational field or gravitational str field strength inside the shell. Okay, we can apply that now to solve this next example, example 5. So in example 5, we're assuming an Earth of uniform radius and radius r, a uniform density and radius r. Find the gravitational field strength at the height r above the Earth's surface. 
which means a distance 2R from its center, and at a depth half R below the surface of the Earth, which means at a distance uh, of half the radius within the Earth. So for part 1, we'll make use of the fact that we know that when the radius, when the distance is at the radius of the Earth or above, the gravitational field strength is proportional to 1 over R square. And we know that G, the gravitational field strength at the surface, is 9.81. So if the distance is twice the radius, which means I'm lying somewhere here, the gravitational field strength should be proportional to 1 over R square. So we can use by proportions to find that the gravitational field strength <coughs> will be 1 quarter if the distance is doubled. So this should give you 2.45 newtons per, per kg, which means the field strength in twice the radius of the Earth in space is actually four times weaker. Below the surface of the Earth, right, we derive that the gravitational field strength is proportional to R. So if you are half the distance, you should be half the value of G. So half the distance by proportion gives you half the value of G, which is 4.91 newtons per kg. Okay, with that, that's actually the end of the first uh, lecture on gravitation. So we covered gravitational force, Newton's law of gravitation. So F equals to GMM over R square. We also noted that gravitational force is a vector, so when there's more than one gravitational force, we need to add it up vectorially. Second, we covered gravitational field strength, which shows us that if you have any mass, it changes the property of space around it such that if I put mass within those space, it will experience a gravitational force. So we call that gravitational field strength and gravitational fields. Now here's a little bit ex extra enrichment, and it turns out we can use some A-level physics to, to, to talk about dark matter, some very mysterious uh, topic, right? Like, what is dark matter? Well, basically, we think that all matter, um, we can detect it by checking the amount of light or the type of light it produces. So, for example, if I if there's some gas there, it would, because it is at a certain temperature, it should emit radiation. I can detect it by looking at the radiation it produces. So, if it's very hot, it'll produce visible light. If it's less hot, it'll pr produce infrared radiation. So, I can measure that. But it turns out there is some kind of matter that is invisible to us. The only way we can detect it is through its effect on gravity. So because we do have a knowledge of gravity, this invisible matter, we can deduce its existence. So this is a picture of six galaxies. And what's common about these six galaxies is that they're rotating quickly. And they're rotating too quickly. What do I mean by too quickly? Well, if we consider an object of mass m, and a small object, small m, placed at a distance r from it, what would the relationship between its speed and its distance be? So if you want, you can pause, and you can try to derive this. Okay, you need to use another topic's uh, con concept to apply for this. right? So the object small m is actually moving in a circle around big M, and the circle's radius is r. Ah, so it will move at a certain velocity. So, if you want, you can pause it and try to work it out. The answer is it's actually proportional to square root of 1 over r, which means the further this small mass is from the big mass, the slower it should be because it's inversely proportional to the distance, right? And it's inversely proportional to the square root of the distance. So how we can get it is we can say that the gravitational force GMM over R square provides the centripetal force MV square over R. Equating these two, we can get rid of small m, the small masses of the small masses mass, and find that the velocity of the small mass will be square root GM over R. And capital M is the mass of the big mass in the center, and capital G is the gravitational constant. So we can we we can say that V is proportional to one over R square root. Now. In a galaxy, most of its mass is actually concentrated within its center. And some mass is on the outside, but the mass generally diminishes as you go on the outside. But we can actually look at stars that are on the outside of galaxies and measure their rotation rate, how fast they orbit the center mass. So the approximate 
situation is like the one that we just discussed, right? There is most of the mass lying in the center. A star that's on the outside part of the galaxy, we should be able to calculate its speed. And this speed should be somehow dependent on r, not exactly dependent on, not exactly this equation because there is some mass in between, but it should generally go small, slower and slower, right? The velocity of orbit. So when we're looking at all these stars, we can actually calculate how much mass there is and take that into account. So it turns out that for stars, on the further away you get from the center, the star speed should start to decrease after a certain point where all most of the mass is already inside, right? And it turns out when we, they did experiments on measurements of many galaxies, not just one, uh, many galaxies, the stars on the outside are actually moving at a faster speed than the stars on the inside. But this doesn't make sense because if you count the masses from the starlight produced, most of the mass is actually inside, within, right? So the speed should decrease after a certain point, but the speed doesn't decrease, right? So there's a few possibilities and scientists will of course try to eliminate all those possibilities. Mm, maybe there's unaccounted mass, maybe there's, star, there's some gas that's blocking our view. So uh, we take that into account. We go and me do measurements and go and check for different galaxies. But we still find that it's consistent, you know. It doesn't obey the 1 over square root r rule. And not only does it not obey, it goes opposite the, 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 the direction. So the only solution that they can think of is the existence of some type of mass that we can't see. That's why we can't take it into account when we count the mass by looking at starlight, right? And we call them dark matter the amount of mass that is causing this extra rotational speed. And we think that most galaxies, right, the stars are concentrated within the center, but beyond the stars, the galaxy itself is surrounded by dark matter halos. So this is the Milky Way galaxy. The yellow part is the visible Milky Way part. And these purple clusters are where we think the dark matter halos are in simulated models. So if you really want to know more about dark matter, and don't forget, we just derived this existence using very simple gravitational and circular motion concepts, right? You can watch this QR code from Kurtz Gazette. It's a quick explanation of what dark matter is, right? So really interesting. It's enrichment because technically it's not within syllabus, but it's doable, right? We can derive it using A-level content. So it turns out we can actually understand quite interesting physics with the A-level content that we're learning. I'll leave you all this um, lecture with a quote from a biologist. Now, he said that it is his own suspicion that the universe is not only queerer than we suppose it is, but it is actually queerer than we can suppose. So there's lots of things to discover in this universe that can pique your interest. I hope that it doesn't have to be physics, but I hope that you will find some interest in the things that you study within your A-level course. Okay, and I will see you after the June-May break um, for Lecture 2 and Lecture 3 of Gravitation. Please, uh, complete this post-lecture quiz by scanning the QR code and filling up the questions. Okay, so it's just three questions. Very simple. One of them is a Q&A question. And I will see you in the next lecture. Thank you very much.